So great to have a, a full room um, of enthusiastic people. I'm Carrie Weber, for those of you who don't know. I'm the executive director of the Fairfield University Art Museum, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for the opening night festivities for Suzanne Shamlin's Studies in Color. It's great to have you here. Before we get started with tonight's remarks um, by the artist and her conversation with Professor Maurice Rose, I have an exciting announcement. That's where the clapping's gonna come in. And a few brief remarks. The announcement, which, which I know some of you have already heard, but which I want to share with everyone because we are simply busting with pride, is the Fairfield University Art Museum has been awarded accreditation from the American Alliance of Museums. This, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is the highest national recognition award afforded to American museums. Receiving accreditation signifies excellence, and it will bring national recognition to our museum for its commitment to excellence, accountability, high professional standards, and continued institutional improvement. The whole museum team worked very hard for almost two years to achieve this, so they appreciate your applause and your clapping. Um, I now want you to clap again and give yourself some applause because our accreditation is a testament to the incredible generosity of you, our wonderful donors and supporters who make our work possible and enable us to present programs of the highest quality for the benefit of our students, our faculty, and our community. So let's all clap again for each other. I'm also delighted to announce tonight our new partnership with M&T Bank, and we are so grateful for some bank members' presence here this evening, and we look forward to working in partnership with the bank during the year ahead on a fantastic array of exhibitions and programs. All right, can I see a show of hands, please? Who has seen Christy Rupp's exhibition in the Walsh Gallery? Excellent. Those of you who have not, you have three weeks left. And it's open tonight till 8 o'clock, so you can go see it on your way home if you don't stay here till the bitter end this evening. <laughs> um, three weeks. We're open till 8 o'clock on Thursday nights, in case you didn't know that, thanks to a grant from uh, the Art Bridges Foundation, an Access for All grant. Um, we're open on Saturdays, 11 to 4, but it really is a fantastic exhibition, and it is not here for that much longer, so please try and see it. Okay, back to tonight's festivities. Suzanne Shamlin Studies in Color. We are so pleased to be presenting this exhibition of landscape and still life paintings in which Shamlin explores ideas about color theory and light. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about this in just a minute. I can't wait for you to see how these paintings look downstairs in the Meditz Gallery. That's our front gallery. It's very different than any other exhibition we've had. In the back gallery downstairs, I decided to complement Shamlin's small scale paintings with an exhibition of recent acquisitions of landscape photography, which I curated mostly from works that were gifted to the museum over the last few years. Two of the works were purchases, one which was made possible by the museum's Black Art Fund and the other by annual giving by our 2010 Society patrons. As we so rarely get a chance to highlight works from our um, contemporary works from our permanent collection, we're really delighted to have the opportunity to share these exciting new acquisitions. So I wanted to specifically thank the donors who gifted the works in this show to us, two of whom are here tonight. Um, so the donors uh, of these works were Ben Ortiz and Victor Torsha Jr., Robert Francesco, Bia Nettles, Sue Stoffel, Avo Samuelian and Hector Manuel Gonzalez, Gloria Silver, James Welling, Helen Goldenberg, and Michael Alper. So we're very grateful to them. Okay, now back to Suzanne Chamberlain. We are very, very grateful to Suzanne for being such a fantastic collaborator and partner with the museum since its very inception. She has done so many things with us and for us. I, I could list them, but I'm not going to. Um, this exhibition would not have been possible without her enthusiastic support, and we are so grateful that she is here with us tonight to speak about her work and to be in conversation with Professor Maurice Rose about her artistic practice. We'd also like to thank Dr. Rose for the wonderful essay that she wrote for the exhibition catalog. 
before I turn the stage over to them, I just have to always thank my fantastic museum team of Michelle DeMarzo, Megan Pacwa, and Heather Coleman for all of their work making this exhibition and tonight's event a great success. And I'd like to thank Carrie Lund, the senior administrator of the Fairfield Arts Institute for her assistance with this evening's event. I think you know this, but tonight's talk and conversation are being live streamed and re recorded. So they'll be on our YouTube channel tomorrow or the next day for your friends who missed it or if you want to revisit it. All right, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Shamlin and Dr. Rose. Suzanne Shamlin is Associate Professor of Studio Art in the Department of Visual and Performing Arts here at Fairfield University. Her drawings are in the collections of the National Gallery of Art, Yale University Art Gallery, and the Nelson Atkins Museum. Shamlin has attended residencies at the Albers Foundation, Yado, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, Ragdale, Fundacion Valparaiso, and Edna St. Vincent Millay Colony. Shamlin received her BA from Barnard College and MFA from Yale University. Suzanne Shamlin's gonna make some opening remarks and then will be interviewed, interviewed by Maurice Rose. Dr. Rose is Professor of Art History and Visual Culture here at Fairfield, where she also chairs the Department of Visual and Performing Arts. Her research specialization is in art of the late Roman Empire, especially images of women and objects used by women. Her most recent work focuses on classical sculptures of Venus as interpreted by contemporary global artist, artists. She has served as the faculty liaison for this exhibition. Please join me now in welcoming Suzanne Chow. I'm so grateful to be with you here tonight to share my work. It is so nice to see so many students, colleagues, family, and friends. I'm especially grateful to the museum team, Michelle, <laughs> sorry, Heather Coleman, Michelle DeMarzo, Megan Pacwa, Carrie MacWeber, the installers, the painters, to Maurice Rose for writing about my work, and to everyone who has helped to make this exhibition possible through your support. Graydon Parrish, Nicole Popple, Lynn Porter, Ira Richer, Kathy Schwab, Squid Frames, Malcolm Varen, Scott Waddell, and to all of the property owners whose sites I painted on or near. Painting challenges me to observe and examine the world around me. Each time I start a painting, it is like starting anew. Some paintings take more time to resolve. Others, like the pieces of a puzzle, come together sooner. Staying open to possibilities and working with the changing light and weather conditions are a part of my process as I observe and interpret what I see. Time and change are threads in my practice and experience of making art. I rotate paintings that I am working on in my studio with the change of season and weather conditions in the landscape paintings, and it seems in the interior still life paintings too. Albert Henry Munsell was born in 1858 and lived until 1918. He was an American painter, teacher, and inventor of the Munsell color system. The theory organizes color based on three properties, hue, which means basic color, value, which means lightness, and chroma, color intensity or saturation. I first learned of Munsell from my husband, Ira, who was familiar with his theory from Cooper Union, and afterwards when I was a resident at the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. Foundation, there was a lot in the library. I saw a copy of Munsell's A Color Notation that Munsell had um, written in 1905 and that Albers owned, and this piqued my curiosity. In the summer of 2012, I took a workshop on the color theory of Munsell at the Grand Central Academy with Graydon Parish, now Grand Central Alliance in New York City, which started me on my journey of charting colors by the Munsell system by hue and with a fraction value on top and chroma on bottom. So here's an exercise of painted ribbons that I did when I was taking the workshop. And Munsell organizes the um, color with, for example, you would have an, a 7.5 R would be the 
color and then the top part of the fraction like a two or three would be the value how light or dark a color is and the bottom of the fraction would be the chroma how intense or saturated the color is in reflecting how now on how i've spent my time leading up to the exhibition i have gained inspiration from observing landscape interior stills and observing my own art making practice I enjoyed the collaborative aspect of working toward this exhibition. The completion of the sum of the paintings are a result of the curator's eyes. I appreciate that we all see differently and that the experience of how we all receive information is unique and is a unifying practice in art. I work from observation, interpreting what I see. In 2016, I started working on this painting called Painter Hill Road and developed it between 2016 to 2020 and returned after the pandemic in 2021 to 22. I enjoyed the quiet of the road, the geometry and spaces between the buildings, and I noticed changes from before the pandemic to after. More cars and trucks passed through this quiet road. I worked on site. Some of the challenges in creating the painting were the changing light, fluctuating weather conditions, change of seasons, change to my schedule, changes to my time and to me. I worked on this painting over a period of years between the months always of May through September. I had been focusing on the foreground. Oops. I had been focus focusing on the foreground, considering ways to depict the changing the changes of the grass, the colors that I saw in the grass when I last worked on the painting in September of 2022. For this painting, I used white and then a set limited palette of three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Of three pigments, I was curious to use together. At the same time, parallel to my process of making paintings, I have been studying the color theory of Munsell and charting all of my pigments, as I mentioned before, on the hue, value, and chroma. After a few years of working on this painting, through the challenges of the painting, I noticed that the blue and the yellow I had chosen, Holbein Verditer Blue, 6.1 PB, 5 over 12 on Munsell theory's chart, and Holbein Cadmium Yellow, Lemon, 6.1 Y, 9 over 12, had a chroma of 12. Whereas the red, which was a Mussini Brilliant Red, 8R5 over 16, was on the 16th chroma, the most highly saturated color of the three. So in, at the beginning, I was interested in these three colors uh, just because I liked the way they looked. But then the more I analyzed them relative to, you know, the, the more I was having challenges with them, then I looked back and, and noticed that these were the there were differences and that the red, in fact, was the highest chroma. I wondered what it would be like to choose three primaries which shared the same chroma and return to the same site. I had experimented with this in a smaller painting coming up later in the slides called Inside Back Porch, which I made on a rainy Sunday a few years earlier. For Painter Hill 2, Road 2, which is what this painting is called, three and four, the next two paintings, I worked with three colors I had charted on Munsell's system at the same chroma. All Holland Naples Yellow Reddish Extra, 8.5 R, eight over six. Nickel Titanium Yellow, 8.5 Y, nine over six. And Blue Gray, five PB, seven over six. The chroma of these colors were the same and the values differed by one digit. For Painter Hill Road 4, the next slide we'll come to, I was interested in looking at connections between drawing and painting. And decided to find shapes and geometry as a first step before applying color. So for this painting, I, I drew with pencil and um, then I went back and worked with the same, with the colors that were all on the same chroma, with the exception of white, which was, was not. Inside Back Porch, I created this in 2017, and I had experimented with working 
with this with the same with the palette where the colors were all on the same palette on the same chroma. So this was the first painting that I had tried that in, and it was um, yeah. And in this next work, rose bush painting, I created this in 2019, working inside our porch, looking outside to a rose bush I saw on a misty day. In fall 2022, an introduction to painting, my students and I explored using a set palette of earth tones of Windsor Newton paints, titanium white, burnt sienna, raw sienna, and ivory black. I wondered what it would be like to use the same palette, and I worked on this painting on site um, at a hangar, looking at the hangar in the plane with the same pigments. These two paintings or of the same palette, the same earth tone palette. I have started to read Denman Ross's writings on drawing and painting and the relationship between tone and color. Ross was a painter whose life, who's, who lived between 1853 to 1935. For this painting, violet is a cool lightener instead of white. Ross's color theories of set palettes suggest using yellow and white as a warm lightener and violet as a cool lightener. In vase and leaves, in this next painting, I used a yellow lightener, returning to the same palette I had struggled with in the first Painter Hill Road painting, using Holbein, Holbein Cadmium Yellow Lemon 6.1Y 9 over 12, and the same um, red and the same blue. In autumn yellow and the next painting after this, I experimented with the same earth tone palettes from the, the plane, the airport paintings, the same pigments that I had used when I was at the airport. I was curious what the limited earth tone palette would be like on a yellow ground or on this reddish ground applied a few years before with three primary colors. So I, so this, ground I applied, it looks reddish, but it's actually three primaries. It's blue, yellow, and red combined together. I began this painting, which I had in my, in my notebook, which I keep. Um, I keep a notebook of all my paintings, and so I called it B6 for several years. Um, but it's actually called Untitled now. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you think that's funny. <laughs> but I wrote here B6 because I'm so familiar with B6. It was a challenge, this painting. That's not in my, in my notes, actually, that it was a challenge, but it was. Um, by applying a ground, I started it um, by applying a ground in the winter of 2019 and returned to working on the painting in July of 2021, and then returned to working on it again in May of 2023. I worked with complementary colors. And I also worked with um, Denman Ross's theory of using a, a blue lightener. I have multiple paintings open in my studio, observing light through change in time. Howe's study, which was called Painting X in my notebooks, I started this painting in July, on July 3rd of 2016 with Old Holland Magenta 2.5 R 2.5 over 10, Old Holland Cobalt Aurelian Lake 3.7 7 over 12, and Old Holland King's Blue Light 5 PB 7 over 12, and a zinc white. My initial interest was in the shadow that is created each day at the end of the day. I returned to working on it in 2019 after that began after that, and then I started to grid it, um, to, to draw into it with chalk. This painting is called River Road Preserve, and I developed the painting with complementary colors and a limited palette. For this painting, I also experimented with Denman Ross's lightener of light yellow. In House Study Morning, I used a limited palette of earth colors. I wanted to see what would happen with a lower key palette and used yellow ochre, raw sienna and raw umber and ivory black. In this painting, I use the same palette, but I placed the colors on a yellow ground. The ground was actually created with cobalt blue, cad cadmium scarlet, 
cad yellow lemon. I had seen a yellow house down the road that I wanted to paint and my friend Ginger and I went to the site and I returned to the house to create um, different paintings. Yellow house studies and yellow house um, were created from the yellow houses that are down the road. In window study, lavender, let's see, yeah, window study, and in the next slide, lavender and window study, summer. In 2023, I responded to the geometry and architecture of the window and that it would be a constant and stay the same. And I, could, and I liked that I could peer out the window to observe the change of light and seasons. So just go through some of these slides that we're going, um, that are, uh, tell you a little bit about my process in the past few years. It's my, um, my cabinet that um, my husband helped me get was from Germany, we ordered it and then I plotted all of um, my colors on it. Like I organized all my colors in the, in the cabinet. And then these. Um, to prepare, I had the pleasure and privilege of visiting Suzanne's studio and seeing the paint swatches um, that she just showed you. So my first question is about that with relation to your color theory research. Um, how do you make those swatches? Why? How, how is those that we just saw on the screen uh, become part of your painting process? Yeah, thanks. That's a wonderful question, Maurice. Um, well, I started by thinking that I want to just take all of the materials that I have, all of the paints, and I want to um, become familiarize myself with them, like where they are on the Munsell system. And so I started with free form, um, just putting circles down and just saying, this is what this looks like, this is what that looks like. Um, so I did that to start, and then I started making the, the more rectangle, rectangular um, swatches and charting them all on Munsell system. And then I started to look at different brands of paints. Um, so I was told um, a long time ago in graduate school that Old Holland was the best brand to use for oil paints. And I always, I, I always trusted that it just was, but I was curious about other brands like Musini, Schmicky Musini, and um, Kremer Pigments um, and um, Windsor Newton. So I started making charts. Every time I got a paint, a tube of paint, I would chart it on the Munsell system. That's yeah. fascinating. Um, all of the works in the exhibit are oils. And the ones that you showed us, do you prefer oils for this kind of color experimentation? Yeah, thank you. That's another great question. Um, so I've worked a lot in ink and wash and also in watercolor. And um, I guess the oil paints, uh, I sort of decided to work with oil paints the last 12 years, or I was working with it before, but I, it was a way to really get used to my materials to work with the oil paints. And this kind of work I think can be done, like the color swatches can be done with any kind of paints. But I mean, Albers used the color aid paper because you didn't have to, one didn't have to think about the application of paint, which can be so tricky. Like, you know, how much uh, solvent, how much water, the translucency, the opacity. And so there are many reasons I think not to use um, paint when you're doing color studies as Albers thought. But for me, um, I wanted to just uh, really deepen in my understanding of oil paint. So I've committed myself to oil paint the last um, many years, yeah. When you use other media, are there certain subjects you prefer, for example, when you use watercolor or inks and washes? Yeah, so I think the subject matter is, um, I was thinking a lot about this question. There are a lot of, in the exhibition, there are a lot of um, the pieces of architecture like houses. And for me, the subject matter is as much my materials as it is what I'm looking at. Um, I'm getting, uh, when I consider subject matter whatever I'm becoming familiar with and getting to know more and more on a deeper level. And so, um, and also subject matter can change. So 
uh, so both my materials and the subject that I choose um, become subject matter. Um, there are rarely people in, in your artwork, at least that we've seen tonight, although there's evidence of people. There are houses and cut flowers. And what draws you to landscapes and still lives rather than figural studies? Mm. Yeah, well, I love thinking about the question. Um, I love I love figurative paintings. I love, and and when I'm painting in the landscape, I think the landscape might the landscape of my mind. And those of you who know me well um, probably know this too. The landscape of my mind is very much about people. Like I'm always thinking about people and my relationships. And um, I love the quiet of the landscape. I love um, I love the uh, I love being outdoors. I also love the challenge that the weather is changing. Um, the wind is the, the trickiest um, part of painting outside, but I, I like that there's a rigor to it that I, that I like. Um, in terms of people, I love the paintings of Lucy and Freud, and I look at them a lot, especially his palette. Um, I think, and, and so for me, subject matter uh, is, I, I feel like I would love, I. I I, I like I enjoy painting everything and anyone. I think if I'm going to paint the figure, if there were people in my landscapes, then um, I want to consider how that might be. Like if I had a figure in my a model in my studio, what that would be like, what that relationship would be like. Great. Yeah. You just mentioned the challenge of wind. When I visited Suzanne's studio, she mentioned there had been a bear in her backyard. <laughs> so be careful out there. <laughs> um, your paintings avoid obvious narrative uh, do you think about the viewers response or the story they might create in their minds when you're painting yeah i have to say that i'm usually so challenged by working out a painting that i rarely think about what the story is going to be and i don't think really of myself as someone of of trying to tell a story so much from the landscape as much as trying to capture the experience that I'm having when I'm out there, like um, might be a visceral experience or an experience about the weather or, um, or the light mostly. Yeah. Your process is like the French Impressionists. Um, some subjects are returned to in different seasons or at different times of day, like the airport and the Painter Hill Road series is a series ever finished for you or do you anticipate returning to any of these series that we'll see downstairs well i really appreciate the question because it's something that um i think about all the time because it seems that nothing is really ever finished for me i'm always saying oh i think i'm going to return this i see one more thing that i i want to do there's even with writing this for tonight there was one more sentence i wanted to change there was one more word like when is it going to be enough? And <laughs> I, I think from the from what I hear that that I'm not alone. That a lot of people experience that. And so, um, I think that what I what I come to is that it, the transition from one object to another, like one for me, for one canvas to another, is just. Um, a movement. It's just like a transition. And that the transition really has to be formulated in my mind, like when I'm ready to transition, and that it's actually very fluid. That it that I, that would be, a, I think, a really wonderful way to start to um, think of it, as opposed to this is this word of finished, you know, mm -hmm. because I think it's I think my whole the whole painting process is one of transforming and growing and learning. Well, speaking of learning, um, I think we have students in the audience and certainly aspiring artists probably um, watching online. Can you discuss some of the challenges, other than wind and bears, um, <laughs> that you've faced as an artist and advice that you would give to students or aspiring artists? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I think there are many, um, many challenges. Um, one is prioritizing time, finding time to, to continue to create work and make work. And um, I think that like any field, um, devoting yourself to, to making art is, is one part of the practice. And there's so many other um, elements to going into to, to being an artist. Like for instance, writing up a checklist, making sure that your punctuation is correct, 
um, writing on the back of your paintings to write the title of the back of your painting and finding the proper tool to do so with, like for example, a china marker, but maybe sometimes china markers don't work that well on linen and you're getting ready for an exhibition and then you're writing with a china marker on a piece of linen and then you're worried that it's going to indent the, the painting. You know, so there, and framing um, photography, which we recently, which we talked mm -hmm. about in email this week of your work. So there are so many components. So I think that um, organization and, 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 and being able to accept this, that making a painting or buying art supplies is just one small part of the, of the practice. Yeah. Thanks. I think that those are all the questions that I have, but are you willing to take some from of course. the audience? Yes. Great. Melanie. Hi, Hi Melanie. Hi. If we're working, if um, Suzanne is working on paintings for years, how does she decide when they're actually finished? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And um, like, so there's one painting, it was painting X. And actually my paintings, I don't, they're not always in alphabetical order. So painting X for me was like, painting X. <laughs> when will I finish painting X? You know, it's been going on for six years. And <laughs> so that particular painting was completed by the curator's eyes and perhaps all of your eyes. Yes, because I was intending to go back and work on it. So that was more of a collaborative finishing, which I learned about myself that I really appreciated. Like, because painting often I think of as pretty solitary, at least for my, the way I've painted. And so I'm making these decisions on my own. So I kind of really welcome that I had other sets of, I'm very much welcome that I had other sets of eyes. Um, right now it's, it, the, the time has, I think, been more influential in my decision making than I have been. And it's something that I want to change and reflect on. So in other words, I'll be working on a painting all summer long and then September comes and you know how busy we get in September as professors and so, you know, and the season is different. So I, the, the color looks different. So then that painting I'm not returning to for another year. And then that year I say, hmm, I've been living with it for a year and maybe I like it the way it was. So maybe I'll just leave it. So a lot of it is um, time and change affects a lot of my decision making. But yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nicole. <laughs> How do you choose the location or um, the still life? Is it sentimental or is it just what you drawn to? So mm -hmm. The question is, how do you choose the location? Um, is it sentimental or one that Suzanne is drawn to in some other way? Yeah, and the still life, or is it sentimental? And still lives, right. Yes. So the location, I think, is um, a complex, very complicated question and a really great question. Thank you for that. Um, like I was really drawn to the barns in Painter Hill Road, which are actually, it's called Topland's Farm. Um, and, but I, uh, so I was really drawn to the geometry and just the low, the long buildings. And when I got there um, and I found us, so one of the is like, is there gonna be a place where I can park? Um, <laughs> it's very, it's very basic. Yes. <laughs> um, and when I do park there, what will it be like to sit there? And so Painter Hill Road was actually very open. Like after the pandemic, there were a lot of trucks passing through this very rural bucolic road for some reason. And so it was less private than other locations where I've been. So I think how, for me, how comfortable I am in a location affects my focus when I'm painting. And if I don't feel that comfortable, then I'm less focused. So I've been thinking a lot about that. And in some more um, private settings, then I can maybe focus in a, a little bit more. And with the still lives, well, I've been painting flowers recently. And I thought that by, I, thought, I know that by painting a flower, by painting a vase of flowers, that it's going to be simpler than painting a, a landscape. <laughs> and it's not at all, because um, the light keeps changing anyhow. So, and I like to work with natural light. So, um, and it's, painting is, I think, challenging, so it's as difficult, I feel. 
did you ask um, permission from the farmers to paint there or did you just set up camp? Yeah, that's a great question also. Um, I didn't ask permission, but they, 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 I did ask permission. I, I didn't actively go and knock on the door because I, I, I'm, I guess, by nature, a little shy. My friend Ginger does, she'll do that, and I admire that so much. And we've gone out painting together, but she'll maybe, you know, and I, I didn't call because I was just, I was, I didn't know how to really approach it. But I, I stood there and Div, uh, a truck came by and they said hi and I said are you the uh, at one point I said are you the, the owner and they said yeah it's perfectly fine for you to paint here yeah so <laughs> Philip thank you Jane you guys are such a nuanced work relatively rare you're seeing the, the nuances but could, could you help us out when you look at the early work you can decide to back seem to be more freer in your color application, and you seem to be more engaged with color. When you get to uh, the, the, the final study of the house study, you really become very connected to the grid and the structure. So which gives you more freedom, in the form or in your color? How do you balance the tension between the form and the question is balancing tension between form and color and the slide we saw with the, with the grid versus the more freely painted colorful ones. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's at really the heart of what I've been thinking about a lot, Philip. So thank you. Um, because I drew a lot with ink and washes for, you know, 20 years, ink and washes on paper. And drawing for me was always drawing and painting was something separate. And I didn't really think of them as, you know, preparatory drawings for my paintings. I loved the freedom of working in my studio on um, large scale paintings um, just from my head. And I always felt that the drawings uh, somehow just yeah, um, helped me understand form. But I didn't I wasn't really interested in drawing and then transferring that to a painting. So. I think that I've been really examining and thinking about the question of how does how do I relate to form and also how can I work on a painting for a more sustained time? Because in Inside Back Porch, um, that painting was made fairly quickly. Um, and so the nature of landscape paintings, I mean, sometimes a pain, I'll work on a painting quickly. And I really wanted the richness of being able to work on something over a period of time. So for that reason, I've started to question how can I draw and paint and how can the two be interconnected? And in, in, in house, in that painting, that, as I mentioned, that was finished by the, by, not by my eyes, because I was about to go and paint back into that grid. Um, I had every plan to go into, because I had studied the grass, the way the grass was going. Um, and so maybe in another iteration, in another life, or another <laughs> canvas, I'll do that. Michelle? I have a question about your pigments. You mentioned that you branched out from Old Holland, you were comparing things like Kramer. What have you found, and how do you choose which brand you're going to work with on a particular painting, or do you mix them? The mm. question is how does Suzanne choose her pigments? How does she choose which brand, and does she ever mix them? I was mixing them without really considering that that the binder would be different. So Painter Hill Road painting, I just chose the colors. They were, I think, two different brands, Holbein and Mussini. But then I started to examine that uh, Mussini had felt uh, more le less solid. Old Holland had less linseed oil in it. Um, and so I began to wonder whether it's best to keep the pigments similar, if similar brands. So now I've just been working with sim the same brand for each painting. And um, there's so many brands out there. Um, Kremer Pigments is amazing. And um, I have pigments that, I'd li that I have at home that are actual pigments that I want to mix with oil, with linseed oil, um, and make my own paint. Um, and I have made my own paint with Kremer. Um, but I like Kremer, and I like Old Poland, and I like Schmincke Mussini a lot. I like the colors in each of those brands a lot. I noticed you set certain rules for certain pictures, like the chroma and the early studies. 
how freeing do you find those constraints? And do you find yourself wanting to break your own rules? <laughs> Did she want to break her own rules? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I give myself rules because I think that's good for me because I think that otherwise I, I there with too many options. Like I think that's that's one of the reasons I started to study Munsell is because there's so many pigments and paint brands on the market and you know between and I've even bought like gold paint and you know silver paint and 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 so how can I make limit and so I think with this limit small window like limiting myself that it allows me to be freer um, because I try not to break my own rules mm -hmm. yeah I try to say I'm, I'm just like I, even if it's like the Painter Hill Road series I said you know I'm going to do a series where it's all this 20 by 30 inch 20, 10 by 20 inches and I learned from that I learned the difficulty of it because it's not part of the golden mean it's you know long horizontal and it had many more challenges than other canvas sizes and actually what I decided to do after working on that series is I had a lot of the same, uh, the same proportions painted on for grounds to go back and work on little paintings that, with that proportion, but I flipped them and did the flower paintings instead because I found the Painter Hill Road, that format, to be extremely challenging. Any other questions? Hi. Of course, Amy. I was wondering what it gave you a month of for a series that took uh, talking so much time and a lot of interest and for others. Yeah, so thank you, Amy. Why did the Munsell system um, speak to Suzanne more than other color theory systems? Yeah. I think um, as an undergraduate, I studied liberal arts, and I didn't. I went to art school for one year to Tyler School of Art, and um, and I always admired um, the training that one one could get from a more of a BFA program and I, I was interested really in in uh, in any all systems of understanding and so Munso was something that uh, my husband Ira was familiar with he he had mentioned to me a long long time ago and then I saw this little book and I was curious I didn't know anything about it and so I guess because I didn't know anything about it I wanted to study it more um, but there are so many different color theorists, but that, but there was also an application element to it. So it wasn't just reading, so I could take this course and I could apply it. So I think, and then I thought, well, that would be really interesting since he says that the colors are, you know, that he has like the chroma is the brightest and then the dullest chroma, that what if I took all of my paints and just charted them? So that way um, I would really know specifically where the chroma was. And it really started when I was in my studio um, and I saw, in my paints, my earth colors were all in a bowl. And I had Italian, yellow earth, yellow ochre, raw sienna, and then other colors that all looked similar. And I said, well, they all look similar, but they all have different names. How do I know? I mean, it's just a feeling. I might choose this over another, but is there a logical reason that I might choose one? So I thought by then specifying it by Munsell system, by a numerical system, that I would know that one is slightly brighter than the other, even though they're earth tones. Oh, one more. <laughs> How do you deal with the changing light outside when you're painting? Yeah, thank you. That's a really wonderful question. And um, I guess the painting sort of uh, talks, um, I let the painting sort of direct me now as, a mu as, as opposed to saying that, um, you know, being too attached to that my painting has to look exactly like what I'm seeing because the time is, the weather is always changing and the time is always changing and the light is always changing. So um, that's the, the same thing that I struggle with and the same thing that I am challenged by is also what I have to sort of, um, bend to that I can't even though I see this this light it might not be exactly that light on my canvas but it'll be a different kind of light on my canvas but sometimes in answer to your question like more logistically like it um, I try to go back the same time of day when I can so I really like the golden hours you know 4 30 to 5 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock 
Um, I like early morning too. I've never been really a very early morning person, but I've tried. I've, I, I do try in the summertime. I try to set my alarm for 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, sometimes go out there, but it's, you know, it's different. Um, and I try to stay away from noon because um, the, the light is just so bright. It's hard to see the colors on the canvas, I find. And I really love cloudy days for being able to see the colors. I always was writing in my notes, you know, waiting for sunny days and beautiful days. But actually, the cloudy days are the days when I feel I can see the colors the most clearly um, on my canvas because there aren't the there's there's not a strong contrast. Yeah. Did you have a question? I was just curious with the uh, your notes that you created. It, it's I see a publication of a 21st century artist. I'm wondering if that's in the works or. In the future, I was, uh, I was using this to myself here. Here's, you know, like an update of, of you know, your life of pupil, perhaps, or you know, study. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if you uh, and your notes. Thank you. I'm so humbled by your question. And so, if you could just the question was um, is Suzanne planning on publishing her notes? <laughs> Well, my notes are really very scribbled, and um, I don't, I don't, I don't go in order often. I don't know why, but it's sometimes because I have so much to do. Like when I come in from painting outside, then I have to, you know, clean my brushes, put things away, and then I want to remember what time of day it was. So I'll write sometimes in the wrong place, and but I always write down what the Munsell colors were, and um, but you know, I took the workshop and. I interpreted what I learned about the Munsell system, but there are many people, many artists who are working with Munsell who were trained at Grand Central Academy who do it very um, systematically and very traditionally. And I um, only sort of tasted it and just used it in a way that I then experimented with. So the ribbon painting um, is an example of what I learned from the exercises there that many more classical painters are painting with. Um, so, but that, thank you. I would love that sometime. <laughs> yeah. I take notes about all sorts of things like the Munsell colors, but I also take notes about how far I am standing from the site where I am, like exactly where my easel was because I get the stakes, you know. Important knowledge to know and pass on too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and the fact that you are experimenting and not just doing what they're teaching you, you're doing something different. Oh. So, yeah, mm. let's get that out there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, oh, Suzanne. Did you have a question? Yeah.